dropping them to three and two and um, suffer their first loss in SEC play. Another loss on the road. Uh, we'll get into some of that game, but definitely want to look ahead to Saturday's matchup. We'll have a uh, Tori Petri from ESPN on to preview the game. She'll be the sideline reporter for ESPN and SEC Network on Saturday. So definitely uh, hang hang tight for that. Uh, Nick, how are you doing, my friend? Doing well, Zach. Doing well. Uh, it was a good trip to Lexington with you. Uh, your first yeah. time. Um, had a good time in Lexington outside of the game. And uh, yeah, got to get back in the win column. Um, and I think we've had, uh, we've disagreed a little bit. I think you've called Vanderbilt a must win. And I've called it a must not lose, <laughs> uh, which which I think are, are, are different. But, um, yeah, certainly a game where Florida needs to bounce back, need to need to fix some things, and uh, need to get need to win on Saturday. No doubt. And we will we'll get into a lot of that on, on today's show and, and obviously, you know, where things stand, um, you know, from the from the uh, homecoming game this weekend and, and what the Gators are going to need to do to get it done uh, against – uh, Vanderbilt. Before we do that, I want to give a shout out to Bird Dogs, our, our sponsor. And if you go to birddogs.com slash gators and use our promo code, you can get a free Hydro Flash style water bottle with your purchase. And uh, you can also find many items on their site. Uh, the hat that Nick rocks each and every week, the polo that is my, my favorite, and also the khaki shorts and pants uh, that you can uh, get, get a hold of. And they do the exact same thing as uh, Lululemon, but fit way better than regular shorts that are made of strict, uh, stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fix, it, fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki shorts, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. So go to birddogs.com slash gators. Use the promo code gators to get a free hydro flask style water bottle with your purchase. And uh, as we head into... Uh, this first segment before we get joined by Tori, uh, definitely want to kind of recap the state of the program now as the Gators uh, fall out of the top 25 uh, was short lived uh, after their win over Tennessee following uh, the loss to Kentucky 33 to 14. The Gators now trying to bounce back after um, really just getting dominated in all phases of the game. I mean, the only thing that they outperformed Kentucky and I guess was in, in the, the passing yards department. Um, you know, Graham Mertz, another solid game, but the Gators are not able to get it going on the ground, are not able to, to protect Graham, certainly uh, scoring uh, not enough points to be able to compete with Kentucky. And then defensively, Florida has basically its first letdown of the season after really elite play from that unit since the first snap or after the first snap at Utah and um, just – Nick, it was, you know, and I, I put this at Gators Online in one of our uh, stories post game. I think it was in my sideline takeaways. But, you know, I saw it obviously sitting on the sideline at the game. Everybody saw it watching on TV. Florida had just a terrible tack tackling performance. And it was so bad, in fact, that it was the, the lowest tackling grade that the Gators have ever received from PFF since it existed. <laughs> Uh, which was all the way back in 2014. So in the last decade, according to PFF, Florida's tackling performance against Kentucky was the worst that it's ever had. I think the grade was 28.2. So um, some credit, obviously, uh, should go to Ray Davis for his 280-yard performance and the way that he ran against the Gators, uh, the second best performance ever by a running back in a single-season game. Uh, but nonetheless – the Gators had their opportunities to bring him down, Nick, and um, tackling will showed up in Lexington. Yeah, I think it was a mixture of um, obviously you're not going to arm tackle Ray Davis. He's going to he's going to run through an arm tackle. Um, I think they're watching the game back. There are some guys that just broke down, didn't force uh, the the play back inside, which you're supposed to do. Also, Florida got dominated on the on the. Off both lines of scrimmage, really, but uh, and talking about the defense. So that means the linebackers aren't playing clean, as we have talked about. And I think that one of the best things that Florida's done this year, and then why the linebackers, Shamar and Scooby, have been able to play so so well, is that um, the interior defensive line has been holding their blocks, filling their like, filling their gaps, uh, and not letting the offensive line get to the second level uh, to get a hat on a linebacker. So I, I think we didn't see that. Um, 
ultimately like Ray Davis did it last year uh, when he played for Vanderbilt. So like Florida knew who Ray Davis was. And um, I think there was just a, a bunch of reasons. I, I don't know that this is uh, what to expect from Florida. I don't think it is. Uh, I think it's more of a, a one-off game. It's just a really poor, poor tackling game. You're muted. Way that they had been playing earlier in the year, I, I think that gives confidence that 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 this could be, um, you know, an, an aberration or an outlier, as uh, Billy liked to say. Um, but speaking of Billy, Nick, before we get Tori on and start talking Vanderbilt, we got to get into everything that came from his post game interview, his Monday press conference, all of the fallout from the game where Billy has. You know, before people were like suggesting it and saying maybe it needs to happen, maybe this is is where this uh, this is what he will ultimately need to decide to do. Now you got it's the floodgates are open, and you've got fans, you've got fan podcasts, you've got reporters, um, anybody with any type of interest in Gator Nation, um, many of whom are are calling for Billy to relinquish play calling duties, and he got asked about it. Um, first of all, he got asked about his play calling after the game was defensive and then was asked straight up Monday if he's considering giving up play calling duties. And it, while it sounds like he won't rule it out and is going to evaluate things continuously right now, um, that's not something that he's interested in doing midseason. And, I, and it remains to be seen if he'll do it after his second year at Florida. Yeah, I don't think we – what would what would you how would you have done it in in midseason? Like Russ Callaway is the only coach with play calling experience. Oh, Billy um, Gonzalez, he called Billy plays out at, at some point during his career. But to your point, he wasn't going to give that over to Billy. Um, yeah, um, I just didn't think like, and I said it uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was like, you like, I, we can sit here every week and yell that he needs an offensive coordinator. It's like, all right, cool. That's that's nice. It's you know, at the time it was September and I'm like, you're, you're yelling at something that won't happen until like December earliest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're just yelling at it every week. And um, so I didn't expect him to say, yep, you know what? Got on Twitter, saw what everyone was saying. And uh, I think I am going <laughs> to get a step, step away. So um, that one tweet from Gator. Yeah. <laughs> Three, two, seven. Um, I, I think it, it's it. I think in my opinion, I, I've never been really um, inspired by his play calling. Uh, there will be a drive, back-to-back -back drives in a game where I'm like, all right, Billy's in his bag. That was really good. Um, but I also don't think he was hired because of his play calling. I think he was hired because he was a builder. Um, he has great culture. He has great structure, attention to detail. Um, he loves recruiting, uh, which the last coach did not. And, and I think – those are the reasons he was brought in to, to rebuild the program, not because, hey, man, this guy is a wizard during games calling plays. So it, it'll be tough. You know, Billy mentioned on Wednesday, you know, he got fired from being the offensive coordinator at Clemson. Um, when he went to Alabama, he was passed over, over and over uh, when they had offensive coordinators leave. Um, he got the opportunity to call plays and. Uh, I don't know that he wants to give it up. I think it's probably the fun part of it for on Saturday for him. Um, but when I go when I go look at it, you know, Steve Spurrier, your guy Zach, once said, "If you get a job for calling plays, don't give it up once you get that job." But everything's different now. Now, like Spurrier would recruit what, like four months out of the year. <laughs> um, you've got to recruit 366 days out of the year. Um, I think Billy, you know, was late to his radio show a week ago because he was on the phone recruiting you're not only recruiting high school you're recruiting your roster <laughs> you're recruiting whoever else is in the transfer portal because your roster can go in the transfer portal sure um he's the offensive coordinator the head coach the quarterbacks coach it's just a lot of hats um and, and i think he doesn't getting a play caller doesn't mean he can't be involved in making the game plan uh moving forward i just don't think that uh florida's offense has looked to the point where you're like Whoever's calling plays should keep doing that. Yeah. Oh, it's a, that's, those are all good points, Nick. And um, I do want to uh, mention for, for one of our uh, um, posters in the comment section, 
that is is concerned about one of your eyes, uh, we will let them know that that is uh, that is Norman oh, okay. to blame for that. Oh. Bro, that uh, a 70 pound old English sheepdog just jumped and hit me in the eye today, like three. My eye's been scratched ever since. <laughs> um, well, I, I do want to take, I guess, end this segment on this because we had our live chat this week at Gators Online and um, a lot of discussion about this topic, among other things. But there was a sense from one of our posters, uh, Swamp Thing, that you and I are on different sides of the fence on what Billy will or won't do when it comes to play calling. Now, again, we're getting ahead of ourselves, very ahead of ourselves, but yeah. what is your read on his willingness to either give up play calling when the time is right or stick to his guns and uh, try to prove that he can do it? Yeah. I mean, I don't think he wants to do it, <laughs> um, but they go through an evaluation and listen, any coach, at this level has an ego, um, some more than others. So like Billy Napier, I think is really down to earth. Um, but yeah, he has an ego. Like if you're a division one college football coach, you have an ego. Um, but I don't think that he will have an ego to the point where if he looks now, this is a big question. If he looks after the season and says, yeah, I think if somebody else were calling plays, if I didn't have this on my plate as well, it might be better for the program. I, I have no, I have no question in my mind that he would, you know, give up play calling duties. Now, does he look at the totality of the season and come to that conclusion? I, I don't know if that's the conclusion he'll come to, but I don't think hmm. that he would be too proud to to step away from it. Yeah, the, the, those are great points, and and I do think that it it would be a situation where he would have to come to that conclusion on his own. Yeah. I think the numbers would have to, at the end of the season, just be so bad that he, even he can't deny it. Um, Will they be that bad? Will there be some ways for him to justify the results so that he stays in charge? Um, I I think as much as he dislikes it and maybe some others dislike it, that is going to continue to be a talking point amongst fans until they start performing to level on offense that uh, you know kills the conversation. So we're going to keep this conversation going. Uh, we've got Tori. In studio, waiting to uh, jump on and, and and let us know about uh, making her way back to Gainesville. So we're going to uh, get to this ad read real, real quick, and then we'll bring uh, Tori on. And want to give a shout out, as we always do each and every week, to My Perfect Franchise. If you're ready to leave the corporate rat race for the American dream, looking for a side hustle while working your current job, wanting to diversify, build wealth, and or leave a legacy, Andy can help. Andy's a franchise consultant as well as a franchise owner and helps people find franchises that fit their skill sets, financial requirements, time to commit, and more. His services are 100% free, and he's here to help if you have questions about business ownership with franchises. You can learn more and contact Andy anytime at myperfectfranchise.net or calling or texting him at 404-973-9901. And now we're going to be joined by Tori Petri. First time on the show. Um, Tori, appreciate you joining us. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And Absolutely. happy homecoming to you. Thank uh, you. You took, the, you took that quite literally this week. <laughs> I did. You know, I heard it was homecoming. I was like, you know what? I'll pop back into town. Um, <laughs> no, but really, I'm, I'm excited to be back um, with SEC Network. I, you know, looking back, I, I went to Florida and 2010 to 2014 and went to the J school there. And I've been the girl running snacks to the crew on the field. I've been the girl running cables on the field. I've been uh, the girl holding the sideline reporters light. Uh, and now I get to be the girl with the mic. So that's fun. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Um, well, before we get into this weekend, all the fun things that we'll be watching the swamp, uh, let our, our listeners and viewers know a little bit about you if they don't. And, uh, kind of your background, and, and obviously you mentioned uh, being a UF grad. Absolutely. I am not only a UF grad, I'm also an Ocala girl. So just 45 Are you minutes an ACR? down the road. Uh, no, I'm a Marion County resident, so okay, okay. a little, little further south. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm from Ocala, went to school about 45 minutes north of home, and um, graduated in 2014, was super involved with WFT, WRUF, that's the radio and the and the TV station at UF, um, 
and it was a great time. I loved my time in Gainesville, such a blast. Um, and then a uh, big weather shock for me, I moved to Detroit after graduating from Florida and worked <laughs> for the Detroit Lions for seven years, uh, which was also so much fun. Um, they took really great care of me in Detroit. The fans were awesome. Um, I was the in-house reporter for the Lions uh, and uh, got to got to cover them for quite some time and do their you know website reports and do also their um, TV shows there. And that was really fun. And then a couple of years ago, I moved down to Charlotte, North Carolina, got connected with uh, doing some ESPN college football sideline reporting. And I've mostly done Big 12 up until this point. Um, I got connected with the Big 12, been doing a lot of Big 12 games, but it's fun to be back in the SEC. That's awesome. How are you feeling about the Lions season so far? Oh my gosh, great. I'm having so much fun watching them. It is a blast. So happy for all my friends there still. I mean, that city deserves to see some success and it is so fun to see them actually getting it right now. Uh, <laughs> I really do hope their season continues to go well. I'm watching, I'm, you know, tweeting all the games and everything. It's just, it's really a blast to watch them do so well. It, and you can hear just how much like that city needed this. Um, oh, yeah. They've had a couple of primetime games and I'm, I'm listening on the TV and I'm like, that sounds like they're piping in noise, like just on TV. <laughs> like, but it's just the people of Detroit for 30 years waiting for the Lions to be good. And, and here they are. They're a really, really good team. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, they, they have been through so many different struggles over the years and my first couple of years there they saw some success under Jim Caldwell got to cover two playoff games there weren't able to win those two playoff games but like I don't know I have a feeling this year could be the year this could be the year <laughs> um but yeah watching that Monday or that uh game the Thursday night game in Lambeau it was insane how many blue Honolulu blue jerseys you saw out there in the stands it was crazy i loved seeing that i mean that's a really fun stadium to go to it should be on any football fans bucket list um but to see the lions kind of take it over so much so that the packers had to like put out a statement about how many away game fans there were at the at the field that was that was entertaining to see <laughs> One of our coworkers, uh, Corey, is a huge Lions fan, so he's uh, <laughs> Love he's it. been enjoying the season like you have. Good, um, good. Now, obviously, Tori, you you got to not only grow up around Florida football, but got to experience it during the Will Muschamp years uh, as we were kind of uh, getting new to the beat ourselves. Um, and, and I'm sure you've kept tabs on Florida football from afar and monitored, obviously, everything that's going on lately. Okay. That this is a big picture question. But what is your just general thoughts on where Florida football is at, all the changes that have happened within the last decade, and just, you know, where you think this program is now under Billy Napier? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely saw some uh, not great football during my time at Florida, yeah. 2010 to 2014. Uh, I, I think we got one year of Urban Meyer, and then the rest was Will Muschamp. Um, and you know, there was some exciting games in there, but you know, <laughs> for the most part, we were just slugging through. Um, and so I didn't get to see a lot of successful football um, uh, over the years while I was at Florida. Uh, you know, I think that Billy Napier, I think it would be tough to expect him to, you know, be winning the SEC in his second year as head sure. coach uh, where, where he took over. Oh, so, dear. you know, I think it's just a process. Um, I know Gator fans have such high expectations and uh, you know, this fan base is like, you know, if you're not winning the SEC, then we're unhappy with you. Um, <laughs> so very high expectations from this fan base. Uh, but I think like, I, I think it's, it's too early to feel down. I know the Kentucky loss was disappointing for fans. Um, but you still beat Tennessee. So, you know, there's still some potential with this team. So we'll see how it goes. How is it? Um, this is just a job question because uh, Zach and I just yeah, cover one team. Um, so it's not, there's never, never really, oh, it's Florida. So there's always something new, something happening. Um, <laughs> but how is it, how is it covering, you know, getting an assignment on Sunday night, Monday? Um, and let's say we're, Hey, they're sending you to Mississippi state. And it's like, well, I haven't seen them yet. What's the, what's a process for you? It might be easier this week, uh, being as Florida, but what's the process for you just to be like, okay, I have five days to really familiarize myself before I'm talking in front of tens or hundreds of thousands of people on TV. 
Yeah. I mean, I was in your position for seven years working for Mm -hmm. the Lions. I was covering the same team every single week, um, you know, all year round. And then transitioning to covering college football where it is a different team every week is definitely different. Um, You know, as a sideline reporter, you have to be ready to tell very concise, well-told short stories in a small amount of time. Um, And they have to be entertaining stories. So I'm not necessarily trying to find out every single thing about a team, like as much as you guys know about Florida, sure. you're, you're in the team, you're around it every single week. But my job is to find the really entertaining stories around the team. Um, and so that part is really fun. I love being able to find some of those, those stories. And, you know, being in the Big 12, I, you know, when I first started, every week was new. Every week was a new team. You find out, you know, maybe if you're lucky two weeks ahead of time and then sometimes a week ahead of time. Um, but, you know, you sometimes don't even have time to turn the page to look at the next week's team because you're so focused on that week's team. Um, but I've gotten to the point in the Big 12 where I've been doing enough Big 12 games that, you know, it's repeat schools. So I've at least been there once this season or once last season. Um, I've worked with those coaches or those SIDs before, sports information directors for uh, people who don't know that term. But, um, you know, so that that part's fun. Being able to repeat cover teams, I really enjoy because you get to go back, you get to say hi to people and you just have a little bit more established rapport. Um, People remember you and they know that you've been to campus before um so that part's fun but this is uh my first time with it with sec teams obviously since going to an sec school so both these teams were new for me this week in terms of like working with the sports information directors working with the coaches um things like that so you really just have to like dive in um and dig deep one of the things i love doing is listening to local podcasts uh, because you guys are around the team all the time. Uh, so that's one of my favorite ways, ways to prep and kind of like quickly get like a bird's eye view of what's going on in that city is like listening to a podcast uh, for both the teams like early in the week while I'm working out. That's kind of like my, my intro to both teams. Well, this was a di- an interesting week to be listening to Florida podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> um, from doing your research this week, and obviously you're already familiar with the team, but you know, you, you got to, you know, dot all your uh, I's and cross all your T's. What, what's been the pulse that you've sensed uh, with this Florida football team and just kind of everything that you've unpacked this week? I mean, I definitely uh, see a lot about the frustration with where the offense is at right now. Um, I, I know that Gator fans want to see a little bit more production there. Um, and like I said, I, I feel like having gone to Florida, it, And having gone to Florida in a time where we were not winning national championships, um, I'm I'm used to fans being upset about about something, you know. Uh, So I think that that kind of comes with the territory being such a storied program. Um, So, you know, I, I, I definitely get the sense that there's frustration after the Kentucky loss. I mean, historically, Florida is not used to losing to Kentucky. Uh, So that makes it sting a little bit more. So I know there's some frustration in the fan base, but hey, there's a lot of frustration on Vanderbilt's side as well. Um, These are two teams that are both coming off of losses, both a little frustrated with with where they're at. Um, So it should be interesting to see how things go on Saturday. No doubt. And then obviously looking at the Commodores, you know, they they got a really talented quarterback in Swan and they're, you know, coming into this game having beat Florida last year. So there's got to be some sense of confidence that they can take. Um, what have you learned about the Vanderbilt team this week and, and what are you maybe looking to see from them on Saturday? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it'll be interesting to see who who plays a quarterback uh, for Vanderbilt. I mean, Ken Seals started yeah. for them last week. Um, A.J. Swan was injured during the week and so Seals got the reps in practice. So they went with Seals because he just had the reps in practice. Swan was available. But it's been interesting um, hearing Clark, Clark Lee Obviously talk this week about how, family. you know, we're just kind of uh, – keeping tabs on things, hasn't really said what, what's going on. Um, so I think that part is interesting. Ken Seals has a very interesting story of how, uh, you know, he has uh, gone from being a backup and or gone from being a starter to a backup and to now starting again last yeah. week. Um, very, very interesting story for him um, and, and his comeback. Uh, But I think that, you know, Vanderbilt has been struggling, too. I mean, they're I think they're they could be susceptible to the passing attack if Florida decides to throw the football this weekend. 
Um, they are one of the worst pass defenses in the SEC. They're allowing 261 pass yards per game. Um, oh, wow. You know, they were kind of improving. Uh, a couple of our guys on our crew have had a couple of Vandy games already this year, which another thing in the in the prep work that helps when somebody on the on the crew has had them already. Um, but a couple of the other guys were saying like, hey, we, we've covered them already this year. They were improving in the passing game, um, but they struggled with drops over the last oh. couple of weeks. I think a couple guys oh, to look out for right. are Jaden McGowan in the slot, um, the wide receiver, yeah, Will Shepard. Uh, so, you know, uh, they do have their threats. They do have their okay. good players. Um, but I think they're just as frustrated of a fan base as, as Florida <laughs> is right now. I'm sure your crew uh, enjoys going to Gainesville with your knowledge of uh, local yeah. restaurants and, and things to do. What has been um, some of the places you've liked uh, traveling to this season? Oh goodness. Like so far over, over the course of the season. I mean, I've been mm -hmm. in all, I've been in all big 12 cities so far. Um, I love going to Morgantown, West Virginia. That's fun. One. Really? Morgantown is a cool little town. Um, I have some roots in West Virginia myself, like a couple generations back. So it's wow. cool for me to go to West Virginia. Um, Do they really cool light stadium. couches on fire after like a big win? <laughs> is that a real thing? You know, they did win their last game against Texas Tech that I was there for, but I did not see any couches on fire. Uh, but it is a fun town. They're passionate about football. Um, I mean, the Mountaineers are their pro team there. There's not a pro team, so they love the Mountaineers in West Virginia. Um, but let's see, things that I have done outside of, um, outside of uh, the stadiums, I mean, believe it or not, I have a Florida friend who lives in Lubbock, Texas, where Texas Tech well, is. So I got to meet up with her. Uh, that was a blast. You know, Gator Nation is everywhere. So uh, <laughs> even in Lubbock, Lubbock Texas. <laughs> Lubbock's in the middle of nowhere, but it's like a nice little college town. Um, I it, went there in 2019 is. for baseball, and it took me eight months to find it. Uh, I had to fly <laughs> into Dallas and then drive uh, over there. Uh, and then you're, you see nothing, and all of a sudden there's like some buildings, and you're like, "Oh, I'm here." Uh, and it's a yeah, super it was, fun it was... stadium too. The the stadium yeah. is super fun. Uh, they have like installed these LED lights that like do a light show that synchronizes with the music that they play in the stadium, and it's like so electrifying. And when I was watching it, like what was going through my head was like, imagine if they installed something like this in the swamp. Like it would be so insane to see something like that in a, a stadium that's that huge. Um, mm -hmm. obviously the, the one at Lubbock is a little bit smaller, but like another place where they love Texas tech football. Like, you know, when you're in these towns where like, these are the, the, um, they're not competing with other oh, sports well, or other teams for attention. For, like like this is now. the thing to do on a right. Saturday in Lubbock. Like it's really fun to be in those atmospheres. That's awesome. And as we wrap up with you, Tori, um, I, I know it's going to be a fun atmosphere for you on, on Saturday. You one, good. have you ever been able to is this your first time ever doing a florida game as a sideline reporter it is i i definitely volunteered as a student um helping out the sideline reporter i would be the person who has the cables behind the camera guy like unwinding the cables for him or rolling them back up um and i you know was a what they call a runner who basically like goes to sam's club and gets snacks for the whole crew um and one time i accidentally got everyone caffeine free uh, Diet Coke, and <laughs> I remember getting in trouble for getting caffeine free because I the needed caffeine. <laughs> um, so just so many memories going uh, yeah. to the stadium, working games. And my oh, senior year, I was one. the WFT sideline reporter for uh, Florida yeah. football, so I was like on the sidelines with my camera filming the game. All right. Um, but first time back it? as a sideline reporter, so that'll be really special. I mean, will it be the, your first time there for uh, the Tom Petty tradition, which uh, we, Zach and I both love? Yeah, I have. I actually went back to a Florida game in 2021. That's the last game that I went to. It was Florida FSU. My brother went to FSU, so got to go uh, do that with him. Um, but my good buddy. You rub it from, in his face, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my good buddy from the Lions, Lomas Brown, uh, Gator great, also uh, Lions offensive line great, block for Barry Sanders. Uh, he and I were good buddies up there in Detroit. We had a podcast together, and he was Mr. Two Bits that day. So I got to come nice. back and watch him being Mr. Two Bits and then hang out with him. Uh, so that was really fun. That's awesome. Well, so um, I did see I did see the Tom Petty tradition then. That was my first experience. 
Yeah, well, now they got the they got the LED lights, um, you know, going. So that'll be a cool experience. And uh, and look, do you have any like uh, you know family that'll be in the stands trying to you know see you at work on Saturday? So uh, my parents actually decided that they would rather watch me on TV, so they could actually like see see me you. Do yeah, my right. work that makes on sense. TV. Um, but my husband is coming as well. Uh, he's flying out from Colorado uh, to experience the weekend with me so that'll be fun too fun to have him are you newly married i am yeah within the last eight months or so oh congratulations to you you as well thank you yeah i got married in february of this year i got married in shoot when that june oh wow very newly married yeah Yeah. very new exciting i haven't messed up yet (laughs) Uh, we got married we got married in saint augustine Oh, cool. uh, I was actually, we got married on a Friday and I was in Omaha, Nebraska that Tuesday uh, covering the College <laughs> World Series. So nice. uh, she was thrilled with, <laughs> with how sure. good the Gators baseball team was this year. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, he had to make sure that he got married uh, not during baseball or football wow. season. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They kind of yeah. the one month. I picked the one month, and then the season still ran into the week. Yeah, that's how it goes. Of course, of course. Of course. Something well, stressful always happens around weddings, but at the end of the day, you got married, and and it was great. Yeah. Well, listen, the, stre- uh, the Tori- stress was: will the groom be there? Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're excited. The uh, schedule worked out that you could make it to Gainesville. I'm sure you were pumped uh, when you got this assignment, and. Uh, we're pumped for you. Glad to have you back in town. Hopefully, uh, the Gators can get it done. You can't show any bias, right? When you're on the air, you got you got to keep it professional. No bias. No bias. I had to make sure this week when I was picking out my outfit, there was no orange, no blue, no black, no gold. You know, that's one of the things that goes with uh, being a sideline reporter. Um, but, I mean, regardless, it'll be fun to be back in the swamp, cover an SEC matchup. Um, lots of fun stories from both of these teams, and I'm excited to tell them. No doubt. Well, we're uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing you back in Gainesville. All the folks uh, that won't be able to be in the swamp will be able to watch you on SEC Network. So definitely keep your eye out for Tori and let folks know where they can follow you as well on Twitter or X.com. Yeah, X. Uh, you can find me at Sports Tori, the word sports, and then my name, T-O-R-I, and that's on X and on Instagram. So follow me both places. Awesome. Well, Tori, we appreciate the time. Um, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy being back Thank home. You. And, uh, we'll catch up with you again in the future. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Take Tori. care. All right. Tori Petrie from SEC Network getting to uh, come back home. I'm sure she's got to love that. Um, come back to SEC country, too. You know, that's exciting. So um, well, we're going to uh, jump into this uh next ad read and then we will uh give you our keys to the game for saturday and uh before we do that i want to give a shout out to prairie dental center the doctor is a uf grad who's practiced in gainesville for three decades has developed a deep understanding of how to diagnose and treat various dental problems along with advanced skills and knowledge to provide more effective and efficient care to his patients if you're having concerns or just need a cleaning prairie dental center offers a wide range of personalized care options to meet your individual needs. Give their office a call at 352-373-3431. Tell them Gators Online sent you and your new patient exam will be free. And as we turn our attention to Saturday at 4 p.m. in the swamp, we finally get a game that is uh, not at 7 p.m. or 7.30 Um I know Nick and I are excited about that. Probably even some fans that are, are excited about that. You want those night games in September, but October you can get away with the 3.30 and 4 o'clock kicks. So um, that will be taking place, again, on SEC Network if you can't make it to the Swamp. But, um, Nick, redemption. I, although, do you think Florida even – gets motivated by last year's result at this point, or do they have enough issues going on that they don't even need to, like, go there? Both. <laughs> but maybe both. Um, I mean, shoot. Uh, it was the saddest, slowest rushing of a field I've ever seen last year. Single file line, very orderly. Um, it's It was a, a bad feeling to, to lose to Vanderbilt. It's always a bad feeling to lose to Vanderbilt. No disrespect to the Commodores. They uh, have the best city in the SEC in Nashville. 
Um, but yeah, I think you have to, if you were on the team last year, that's in, that's in the, not at the back of your mind, that's at the front of your mind that they beat us last year. Um, and then also a slew of issues to fix, um, you know, so definitely both, I think, in my opinion. As you think about this matchup, Nick, and it's, I know Florida fans don't even want to consider the possibility of Florida being able to lose, but it is, um, you know, this is SEC. Anybody can beat anybody, especially the way that the league has looked this year. And this is a team that uh, still got it done against the Gators. I know they're two different squads and a lot of different personnel. But Vanderbilt is capable. So Florida is going to have to bring its A game. Uh, Nick, as you start to think about this matchup, what are some of the keys that jump out to you um, that you want to see not only for Florida that they need to do to win, but also that they need to just show improvement from what we've seen, especially the last couple of weeks? Yeah, well, I don't think, um, you know, I, I'm, I would say highly, highly questionable to see Trevor Etienne, Austin Barber, or Kingsley Aguak in play. So yep. um, I'm not expecting those three guys to play. They were listed as questionable on the depth chart. Um, okay, what can you do in, in the running game without, uh, you know, those three guys? I don't know, but you should be able to pass on Vanderbilt. Can you keep Graham Mertz? upright and healthy um so for me i think it's almost like a a perfect storm if florida were to lose like there's just a bunch of stuff that's happened this week with guys being dinged up um but i, I think you know if you can keep graham mertz upright and give him some time to throw um you know this is a a vanderbilt defense that that florida could throw the ball on if you can get eugene wilson back i think that adds a wrinkle to your running game um Ultimately, this is just – it's not a very good Vanderbilt team. They don't really have an identity or, or the playmakers that Florida um, has on the field. So um, it should be a win. I, I, I don't know that you'll get, you know, a, a big blowout win that you probably want. Um, I, I might even take Vanderbilt, like, with the 18-and-a-half points that they were getting. Um, but, I, but I do expect Florida to win. I, I And my biggest concern would be – Starting Lindell Hudson at left tackle, Damian George at right, Slaughter's here, and it's just like it's it's another new offensive line, another new group of offensive linemen. Um, don't get Graham Mertz hurt the week before you go to South Carolina uh, by week, Georgia. Yeah, uh, Nick, you'll appreciate this. Vanderbilt ranks number one nationally in punt return average, or excuse me, net punt average. 50.91 yards per punt. How do you like that? It's just another great punter from the other <laughs> team that we get to see this week. Um, look, as I look at the keys to this game, Tori already mentioned one of the stats, but man, like given Florida's issues and what they need to do to try and you know show some improvement, I almost feel like you cannot ask for a better matchup uh, because of all the things that they struggle to do, and that's the Commodores. I mean, the Gators have the worst scoring offense in the SEC. They're only averaging 25 points per game. That's tied for 93rd nationally. Well, what's a great recipe for that? To go up against the worst scoring defense in the SEC, and that's Vanderbilt, which is giving up 33 points per game, uh, and they just – They've they've struggled in several categories, um, but but namely passing defense. They're 111th nationally, 12th in the SEC, and that's been a big talking point. As 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 good as Graham Mertz has been, and as accurate as he's been, he's only thrown 15 passes of over 20 yards this season. And if you heard Spurrier on his radio show this week, uh, he was asked for his opinion. He said, "Hey, I I think that." Florida needs to take some more deeper shots. Um, so that's something that I would like to see from them in this game because uh, Vanderbilt is a team that they should be able to exploit. And, um, you know, you if you get Trey Wilson back, uh, you know, that's huge. Obviously, you, you lost Caleb Douglas. So not only is it important to get some things going down the field, but, uh, you know, Who's going to step up at receiver? I think that's important to figure out as well because Douglas is going to be out for several weeks. Um, and then I think another key to this game, kind of sticking with this theme of 
you know, where the Gators need to show some improvement and how bad Vanderbilt might be in that area. You look at them in the rushing department, Nick, they are second to last in the SEC. They're only averaging 97.3 yards per game, which is 121st nationally. You're talking about a Florida defense that is coming off a terrible uh, rush defense performance, giving up 329 yards on the ground, 280 to Ray Davis. Uh, talk about a get right game. This could be that uh, for Florida. And, you you know, obviously we don't know what Vanderbilt might do at quarterback, but I think it's going to be important for them to shut their run game down, especially coming off of last week's performance. Yeah, it's to me, I, like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, listen, I, I've said it before, Florida, just where their margin of error is, if they don't come to play, they can lose to anyone on their schedule. Um, I don't think you should lose this week. My, my big issue is what can Florida do this week that will make you feel like, okay, cool. That, that was fixed. Like that, that problem is no longer a problem. I, I think it's almost like a lose, lose situation because if Florida goes out and wins 48 to nothing, there is a large, an angry Gator fan is not saying, oh man, definitely. I feel better now. You know, that erased losing to Kentucky that erased playing bad against Charlotte that erased going conservative against Tennessee in the second half. That has erased the last three weeks that has made me angry. Nothing, I think, if you're an angry Florida fan, nothing Florida does on Saturday is going to fix that. That's a great point, Nick. Um, if, if you lose, uh, the pitchforks will be sharpened. Uh, I think, you know, they might run out of four sale signs in Gainesville. Um, but it, to me, it's, it's just like, it, that's why I call it a must not lose game. I don't think it's a must win. Like, you just can't, because if, if you win, like I, I called Tennessee a must win, and that was big for the program. It was a big rivalry win. Um, it was a big home win um, and and got momentum going. That was an awesome environment for all the recruits that were there. Yeah. Um, this Vanderbilt game, like you're not going to, even if you win huge blowout, you're not going to get that same feeling. Uh, Cruz says uh, no, no excuse none. if Florida loses. Absolutely none. Uh, John K. Blue says game will be over in the third quarter. Well, shout out to John. He's been, he, John's been in here trolling everybody. He's a Kentucky fan, I think. <laughs> but John's good. Uh, well, um, yeah, to your point, Nick, which I think is great. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I don't really think that that, that, that will happen, um, you know, with the with them being able to get a win over Vanderbilt. I, I don't think that it will uh, erase all the concerns and, and doubts and, and questions that Florida fans have, people nationally have about this team. I think it's going to take – this is the first step, obviously, but coming out and taking care of business at home. But I, I think for folks to start seeing progress and start feeling like, okay, well, maybe something – maybe they're turning the corner – they got to go out and win some road games. They got to go out and win at South Carolina and then obviously uh, buckle up their chin straps and figure out what they can do to compete against Georgia after a bye week. But like these next two weeks is key. And uh, to your point, Nick, I think fans will take a lot more out of maybe a win at South Carolina just yeah. because of the road struggles than they will. I mean, th this is a game that everyone expects for to win despite last year's result, despite all the struggles. Um, that they've had so far this season. This is still uh this is still a game that Florida should win. They're they're favored by what's it now? Is it was 18? Uh, I haven't, haven't done my how to watch yet, Zach, but uh I, the first the first line I saw was 18 and a half. Okay, yeah. I don't think Florida will win by that much, but we'll see. You know? And, and I think they could have if the injury report wasn't the most extensive it has been all yeah. year. Yeah, it's and that, that, key key spots. Like sure, Austin Barber hasn't had the season that we expected him to have. He's still your starting um, left tackle. There is a reason he's been he was named the starter and has started five games. Uh, yeah. So the guy that comes in after him, great opportunity. But there's a reason why you're a backup uh, and the guy is a starter. Not having your left tackle, your center, and your starting or leading running back is never a good formula. It's not great. Um, so look. It could get weird on Saturday, um, but I, I, as long as Florida comes out, like like you said, whether they win 
by a, you know a couple scores or one or whether they blow them out, it's probably not going to change how people feel. Well, um, no, no, no. If Florida wins by one. People will be, will be, will be angry. One, yes. Angry. If they win if they win by a score, though. Angry. 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 Two scores. Four. What, what is the what is the what is the point differential that needs I to think happen? Covering, I think covering, covering. Yeah, yes. I mean, I I don't know, I don't know. It's it's also an eye test, you know. It's not it's not just like Florida. Yeah, like if they out. if they dominate and then they put in all their backups and then they give up two touchdowns in the fourth quarter, like you know what I mean? Yeah, um, I'm like Florida could come out and you know run no huddle up tempo run 85 plays and with them we learn like hey that's not what this offense is supposed to do and it looked <laughs> bad and you win by five and it's like all right well he read twitter he, he listened to us and and he did what we wanted him to do and this team stinks at that so maybe that's why they weren't doing it so i think you know it, it depends on what the team looks like and i think that's why people have been so mad um because it's not just about the record it's well, the things that were bad about the offense last year, bad about the offense this year. Um, and, uh, and then the missed tackling was probably just a little PTSD <laughs> from, from, from last year. It was because uh, they had a game last year that was graded almost as poorly as uh, Saturday's game. So um, before we get out of here, I want to give a shout out and encourage all Florida fans to go to roshop.com if you have issues sleeping, chronic pain, and or anxiety and stress. Um, Florida fans could have used, used some of this uh, over the last weekend for sure. Uh, Rogue Shop sells uh, CBD, THC, edibles, smokables, and vapes, as well as handcrafted bath salts, soaps, candles, massage oils, pain creams, and topicals. Rogue Shop is a true small business. They have five employees and make all of their products with their own can cannabis grown in their manufacturing facility. Visit rogueshop.com. That's R O G U E shop.com. And that will do it for this week's show. Appreciate Tori Petri for joining us. Um, Nick sent out that she was going to be part of the crew this week and she uh, showed her excitement uh, on social media. So her first time getting back to Gainesville. We'll see if the Gators can give her a win, Nick. I, I just, it'd be tough losing to Vanderbilt two years in a row. I think that's tough. I don't, she might not ever ask for another Florida sign. <laughs> first, um, and first and last. First uh, and last. So, look, we, we appreciate everybody for tuning in, uh, leaving comments in the comment section as well. Make sure you guys like and subscribe and stay tuned for all of our coverage this weekend, both on GatorsOnline.com and on this YouTube channel. For Nick Del Torre. I'm Zach Albaverde. We'll see you guys next week.